Dragons are a mystery. They exist in the myths and legends of nearly every culture around the world. But where do dragons come from? And why do all civilizations seem to have their own unique dragon story? Hi, my name is Sandra and welcome to Chasing Gods. In this video, we're going to explore the origins of the dragon symbol by studying dragon myths and by tracking the evolution of the dragon's physical portrayal. Doing this will give us a clue as to why man created the dragon. To get started, the first thing you need to know is that there are two types of dragon. The western dragon and the eastern dragon. Let's start with the western dragon the flying reptilian beast that guards treasures and destroys villages and devours humans, the antithesis of the hero in movies, the terror beyond the mountains. These dragon stories we're familiar with have an extensive history of ancient myths and legends. Let's have a look at some of them. In ancient Egyptian mythology, Apep was the lord of chaos. The Mesopotamian creation myth talks about a massive poisonous sea dragon and goddess of chaos, Tiamat, who eventually was slayed by the storm god, Marduk, and then order ensued. Ancient Greek poets wrote about monstrous dragons. There was Typhon, the she-dragon who guarded springs and treasures, the nine-headed poisonous breath Hydra who was killed by Hercules. Laden, who entwined the tree of Hesperus' garden to guard the golden apples. Sounds familiar? The Greeks also wrote about Andromeda, a virgin princess given as a divine sacrifice to the sea monster, but saved by the hero Perseus, who slayed the monster and married the princess. At the onset of Christianity, dragons were incorporated in Christian narratives. Basically, the same story only different setting, characters, and religious agenda. For example, in the famous myth of St. George, a dragon caused mayhem in the village, and the only way to appease him is to sacrifice young virgins. When it was the princess's turn, St. George, like Perseus, saves the day, this time in the name of Christianity, and marries the princess. Numerous Christian tales follow similar story structure, St. Margaret, St. Marth, St. Romanus. Around the same time, the Norse and Old English wrote about dragons a bit differently. One of them was the epic poem Beowulf, which was remade into the 2007 blockbuster. After having his jewels stolen by a village thief, the wrathful dragon retaliates by burning the village down. The hero Beowulf kills the dragon, but dies in the process by the dragon's poisonous fang. There's also the giant snake named Jormungandr, who englobes the earth with its tail in his mouth, an image we know as the Uroboros. Once he lets go, disaster will ensue. Thor kills him, but in the process, you got it. And there's dragon Fafnir who guards treasures and whose body parts provides wisdom. The hero of this myth, Sigurd, gets tipped off by the god of wisdom, Woden, on how to kill the dragon. This North myth is regurgitated a couple of centuries later as an old English legend named the Lantern Worm. Once in the morning, lantern went fishing in oh, the and they made a song about it. This time, the dragon is a worm who grew huge and destructive. Other versions describe it as a salamander or a snake. The hero, John, gets tipped off by the local witch, and similar to the other dragon hero trend, one must be sacrificed for killing the dragon. In this case, it's the hero's father. You see how myths are retold and mixed with others, with details changing depending on the region, time, and religion? Today, these mashups of dragon myths continue to be told in the form of fantasy films like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings. And there's something else. As we move forward in time, the representation of the dragon starts to look less like a snake and more like the beast we know today, a mix of reptile, feline, and bird with horns. Even if we focus on one specific legend, say the St. George one, that phenomenon also takes place. The reptilian creature morphs into a combination of creatures. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, let's move on to the other type of dragon, the Eastern dragon. But first, just a quick reminder to 
subscribe to the channel if you haven't done yet, and don't forget to click on that notification bell. You can also support the channel by signing up on Patreon, which will allow you to easily donate on a per video basis. Okay, Eastern Dragon. We're talking about the wavy serpentine beast revered by all of Asia. That's right, the Eastern Dragon is adored in the East. Unlike the Western Dragon, the Eastern Dragon is seen as benevolent. The Eastern Dragon is incorporated into architecture, temples, textiles, dinnerware, restaurants, movies, and sports are often named after the dragon. For example, Dragon Boat. I've dragon boated before. It's the symbol of the East, especially in China, where its ancient people claim to be the dragon's descendant. Every New Year, many Asian countries celebrate with a ritual dragon dance. Of the 12 Chinese zodiac signs, the dragon is the most sought after. So much so that in Vietnam, there is an excess of babies born in the year of the dragon. In Asia, the dragon is a symbol of power, fertility, and auspiciousness. It represents wisdom as it's often depicted chasing a pearl of wisdom. It's often seen surrounded by water. Like water, it's good to humans, but it can also be destructive. Because of his immense power, the dragon is to be respected. That's the oriental dragon. Similarly to its western counterpart, its story remains more or less unchanged, but its image has evolved over time. Here, a Chinese jade dragon dating from 4700 BC resembles a curled snake. Horns are then added as seen on the dragon tomb protectors of the 4th to the 7th century. With time, dragons transform to look more mammalian. Its features become increasingly distinctive and systemized. According to Chinese scholar Wang Fu, the dragon has nine resemblances. The head of a horse, the tail and neck of a snake, antlers of a stag, eyes of a demon, belly of a clam, scales of a carp, claws of an eagle, soles of a tiger, and ears of a cow. The dragon also becomes culturally and socially standardized. For example, dragons with five claws as opposed to four are reserved for emperors. Dragons are also institutionalized in religions. They're seen with different Buddhist figures such as Kuan Yin, the goddess of compassion. As we travel south and west of Asia, the dragon becomes interchangeable with the Indian Naga, a revered snake that also symbolizes the powerful forces of nature. The Naga is also associated with the Eastern Pearl of Wisdom, yet it guards treasures like the Western Dragon. This mixing of Eastern and Western features is also seen in the Middle East, where the dragon is regarded as evil like in the West, but it's portrayed very much like the Chinese dragon, long and swirly. There are numerous other dragons from all over the world, but we won't have time to cover them all. They differ in looks, but still have a serpentine base. Overall, in today's mainstream mind, dragons are generally evil, powerful, and resemble this, or benevolent, powerful, and look like this. Despite these differing views, world dragons share universal features and identifying them may help us in answering why dragon myths exist. So what are these features? Dragons are associated to water, thunder, rain, sea, and ocean. Dragons are earthly as well as avian and they can swim. They have a reptilian or amphibian base that evolved to include other animal features. They're extremely powerful, and that includes destructive power. And they're associated to wisdom. Back to the golden question though. Why do most cultures have a dragon story, and why does the dragon look like a snake mixed with other animal features? Sorry, that was two questions. Psychologists and scientists alike have come up with many theories to answer this mystery. Carl Jung, who believes that myths are an expression of our unconscious, suspects that the dragon versus hero myth symbolizes the battle between our id and superego. The two terms come from his teacher, the famous Sigmund Freud. To Freud, the id is the unconscious, animalistic side. Think about the animal's natural instinct of eating, killing, and sex. 
The superego, on the other hand, is our conscious and learned side, the side that differentiates humans from animals. It's our conscience, our moral thinking, our conceptualizing. Young says that the hero slaying the dragon represents the conscious side of man taming or killing his unconscious side. But this makes us wonder, why is the dragon the symbol of that unconscious animal instinct? Can't help but to revisit the physical features of the dragon. For simplicity's sake, let's look at the eastern dragon whose features have already been identified. It's part horse, part stag, clam, carp, eagle, tiger, cow, and of course, part reptile or amphibian. Hmm. Think about it. These roughly cover the animal branches of the evolutionary tree of life that leads to us humans. From the sea creatures, to reptilian, avian, mammalian, and finally homo sapiens, all stemming from one common ancestor. In a way, the creatures that make up the dragons are our ancestors. The dragon is our ancestor! So when the ancient Chinese claimed that they were the descendants of the dragon, they meant it literally? So. Why would the dragon symbolize our animalistic instinct? Well, humans are different from this entire ancestral line in that they have, as far as we know, a conscious mind that is able to go against their instincts. All the creatures before had one thing in common. They behave strictly on instincts. Hence, the dragon being the symbol of our instinctual side. Oh, I know what you're thinking there, smarty pants. How could the dragon image have come up in the minds of our human ancestors when they couldn't possibly have theorized about the evolution of life? Well, some scientists like Carl Sagan believe that the image of the dragon has been passed down in our inherited memory. David E. Jones, an anthropology professor and author of An Instinct for Dragons, proposes that our primate ancestors had to remember the image of its predators in order to survive. Essentially, one has to remember their fear. The predators of our primate ancestors were snakes, felines, and raptors. Mix these images together and voila! It becomes the Western dragon. Our ancestors had to remember the dragon in order to survive. If this is true, this could explain why the dragon has occupied the myths of humankind and why it can swim and fly. It would also explain why mystics and psychologists understand the dragon not as an entity outside of us, but part of us our instinctual part. Because after all, we do share most of our genes with the dragon, or should I say, the animals that make up the dragon. This theory of a hardwired memory would also explain why the mythical dragon is their creature to fear. But then why would the Eastern world praise it? Perhaps it's a question of perspective. The West sees the dragon as their predators, whereas the East sees them as their ancestors. Our predators are our ancestors. That could be another explanation of the Uruboros, the dragon chasing its own tail. All right, all right, I need to calm down. But these are some theories on the existence of the dragon, among others. Some believe that dragons are a remnant memory of dinosaurs, where others believe that real dragons actually existed, to each their own. When it comes to dragon myths, we've only scratched the surface. There's a lot more to explore and to clarify. Still, we've come pretty far. We've looked at the dragon's evolution from a narrative and descriptive standpoint. And from there, we've extrapolated plausible reasons as to their existence in man's imagination. Though they can be viewed as good or evil throughout history, dragons have represented the creative and destructive forces of nature that resides inside and around us for as long as our species can remember. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you to my Patreon supporters. A special thank you to a new supporter, Tangout, who joined at the gold level. Thank you so, so much. And of course, thank you for watching, sharing, liking, and leave a comment. I read every single one of them. Bye guys, see you next time.